Hi, these are edited versions of the lectures that I taught synchronously over Zoom. I hope you find them useful. We're going to get started. Today we have lecture 16. It's going to be on cluster covariance estimation. And as I said, it's going to be, I think, um, an important class because, um, you know, most likely whatever type of uh, applied micro you end up doing, if you're doing that, or even if you do something like empirical macro, uh, you're going to be using cluster covariance estimation at some point, most likely. Uh, one thing to comment is that, as you know, every single lecture here has uh, is taken from lecture notes that I've written, except for this one now, because I decided to do a lot of changes, and that involves um, following different paper and also changing the notation. So this is one lecture where I encourage you not to read the lecture notes. I'm going to update the lecture notes, so, uh, but I probably won't do that until the end of the quarter. So um, for now, this particular lecture, um, you should only look at the slides. Um, so that's the uh, remark there. So um, um, I realize here I forgot to add uh, where we are and where we're going, but um, fair. So in words, um, you know, the last two classes, we talk about um, estimating uh, robust standard errors under heteroscasticity. Okay, we call the heteroscasticity consistent standard errors. And um, we show that uh, the so-called so -called HC standard errors were consistent. We did a proof of that. And then um, last class, we talk about hack standard errors, heteroscasticity, autocorrelation, consistent standard errors. Um, however, if you recall, we did some proof on the arguments. And something we exploited in the hack standard errors was that the observations were naturally ordered. And so we use uh, truncation and we use weighting, two tools that actually exploit the fact that we can sort the observations as in time series. And then we can come up with arguments like, oh, um, you know, individual one at time two, uh, maybe more related uh, or the dependence between time, say, t and t minus one is stronger than time t and t minus three or t minus 10 or t minus 20. So today, we're going to deal with the same problem than sort of like combine the last two lectures in a way, um, talking about heteroscasticity and time dependence. But the difference is that we will want to be agnostic about the dependence at all. OK, so we won't be assuming that there's a natural ordering. And we're going to be thinking about situations, for example, like, um, you know, you have uh, schools and there are students in the school. And so now, you know, it's really hard. You, you want to allow for the possibility that students are dependent, okay? That they have uh, features that make some of their covariance to be correlated, but it's unclear to you, you know, which student is related to uh, which other student uh, in a uh, strong or weak way. And what we're gonna learn is that um, the actual implementation of this is literally one slide. I could just come here, show you one slide. This are the cluster of a standard error. This is how you do the t-test, and this works under these conditions, and then go home. Um, and I think that that's bad because um, these tools actually work under certain conditions, have a lot of pros, and have limitations as well. And I think the most important thing for you is to understand those two. What are the actual really good pros of this, and then what are the limitations? And for that, we will need to talk about rates of convergence. And that's what I'm going to spend most of the class in the middle. But let's get started with the notation. So we're going to have a linear model. Hold on a second. Um, OK, we're going to have a linear model as before. And the idea is that we're going to have um, uh, two indices again. As I wrote here, um, today we could observe a sample size n of y and x in a context where they are grouped into q mutually independent known clusters. And we're going to index clusters today by the letter j. Okay, j is going to index clusters. Clustering can be due to sampling scheme or by the research knowing the correlation structure. So sometimes, you know, you're doing some experiment and you're, you're sampling observations at a given level or 
sometimes, for example, you're sampling families or because they're a part of your study and they're like individuals that belong to a family. You may be sampling schools and there are students that belong to the schools. And then, or you can have an ID sample of individuals, say, across the U.S., but then you know that, I don't know, individuals in different states are subject to uh, different uh, situations, and that may uh, introduce uh, dependence in what you see. And so you may be clustering at a level of, um, you know, of uh, which you suspect that there's a correlation within the data. One thing that I'm not going to talk about today, and that is definitely a topic of um, interest, is situations in which you just have data from units and you have to decide the level of clustering. Okay, so the clustering level is a choice. One usual case would be you have units and you have counties, cities, states. Okay, and then you may uh, want to decide, you know, at what level should you cluster. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to consider a situation in which the clusters are given to us, okay? So I want to think again, you know, for simplicity, we're going to sort of like stick to the situation where we have, um, say, um, um, schools and students within school. One important thing is that we cannot exploit the ordering of observations within a cluster because there may not be such ordering. And as I said, like you have the students, and then, you know, it's unless you know exactly how their friendship relationship works, if that matters, for example, it's hard to tell, you know, whether two given students are more correlated than the, any other two pairs or, and so on. And um, what we're going to try to do is to talk about the tools that we need for this. And then, as always, there are going to be law of large numbers and center limit theorem. Okay. And today is going to be different than last class where we specialize to time series. Today, we're going to be needing... Uh, central limit theorems for independent but not identically distributed random variables. And why do I say independent? Is because uh, one main assumption that we're going to use, and it's going to be the key assumption and the difference in the, that is going to come from the time series analysis, is that we're going to assume that these clusters are independent. So we're going to be completely agnostic about how much the observations within a cluster could be dependent to each other or related to each other but we're going to assume the clusters are independent. So to do limit theorems and analysis or inference in, um, in uh, statistics, you need somehow independence at some point, most of the time. And in IID data, of course, you have that by assumption because you're assuming every observation is independent. In time series, you have that by assuming the conditions that we assume on mixing. Okay, so you're saying, I have independence because if I look at observations that are really far from each other, they are essentially independent. And in the cluster structure is you're going to assume that clusters are independent. Okay. But um, this structure is going to be known because, for example, the schools are known to us. We see schools and we're going to assume that the schools are independent and we're going to be able to be completely agnostic about the dependence within the cluster. The notation is that we're going to have two indices. Okay. The first index J is going to denote the clusters, okay? Um, um, so I don't know why I wrote here observations that may be related to each other. This doesn't make a lot of sense now that I read it. So let's just ignore this for now. Um, we're going to index J. <coughs> Sorry. The first index is going to be J. This is going to denote the clusters, okay? And then, you know, and a cluster could be a family, a school, an industry, a city, as I said before, state. The second index is going to be I, and it's going to denote the index, the units within the cluster. Okay, these are observations that may be related to each other. And these are like family members, students, firms, and individuals. Okay, firms in an industry or individuals in a city in this case. So we're going to be using this notation. The notation should be clear to you because it's going to be essentially the same that I used when we talked about panel data. Uh, but we're going to go over it again. This matrix XJ is going to collect all the covariates in cluster J. So we're going to have 1 to through NJ because there are NJ observations in cluster J. Okay, and then whatever dimension of X we have, which is typically K plus 1, we're going to, is going to mean that this uh, matrix here is going to be NJ times K plus 1. Okay. I'm going to be, as I wrote here, stack observations for cluster J. And we're going to do the same for Y and U. And so 
for simplicity and is actually convenient, we're going to try to index as much as possible everything by J and collapse the units within a cluster in this notation. And the reason we want to do that, because at the end of the day, since we're going to be agnostic about how how dependent these observations within the clusters could be, you know, some of these observations are not going to be very informative. So as much as we can, we're going to try to index everything by J. But as you will see later, we will need to deal with the I's at some point. We assume that Y, J, X, J are independent across clusters, but we're going to remain agnostic about the dependence within the cluster. And the goal is to derive standard errors that account for the facts that X, I, J, U, I, J, and X, I prime J, U, I prime J may be arbitrarily correlated within the cluster. And that's what we're going to try to do. So we're going to start thinking about a lot of large numbers, okay? And today, all the formal results that I'm going to give you are coming from this paper by Bruce Hansen and Lee, uh, which was published in 2019. And um, this paper is relatively new, as you can see. Um, and it's, it's great that it was written because before this paper, like some of these results were all scattered through different sources with different conditions and so on. And now you have a common source where you can go and have a, a very clean and coherent treatment of this topic, okay? So, and that's why partly I revised the notes, as I said, because before I was just taking material from different sources. Now I can essentially uh, follow uh, one paper and be more consistent with the conditions and the notation. So, what we want to do at the end of the day is analyze the properties of least squares and get the cluster robust standard errors for least squares. But as you know, least squares are essentially averages. So you need to understand what's going on with a sample average. So we're going to consider the sample mean, as I said, of xi. And for this case, let's assume um, that um, this guy here is uh, um, a scalar. So x bar is just going to be 1 over n, the sum from j1 to q of xi prime and the vector of ones. So this is compact notation, as I said, because I want to write things as much as possible as a, as a function of j and ignore the i's. But if we just you know, expand this uh, product, well, it's just the sum of the observations within the cluster. So the sample mean is a sum over cluster, sum over units, okay? It's a double sum, and it's just um, this object that we have here on the right. Now, we're going to use this, but in reality, I want you to think about the average as in the first expression. Okay? So the theorem, uh, we're not going to do proof, as I said today, so that's uh, really perhaps for you, but I want to uh, really go over the conditions because it's really important that you understand the conditions that you need. And in particular, I'm going to care about conditions like this one. The theorem says, suppose that as n goes to infinity, we have that the maximum over j of nj over q goes to zero, and that we have this condition over here that is called a uniform, oh, I wrote it here, is a uniform integrability condition, okay? Then you have a uh, law of large numbers. x bar minus the expected value of x bar converges in probability to zero. The second condition, even though it may look strange to you, I'm pretty sure that with Joel Horowitz, you talked about different versions of central limit theorems, including, for example, things like Linver-Feller uh, central limit theorems, and in those you have uniform integrability conditions. So these are like usual conditions that you need to get um, law of large numbers and central limit theorems when you have observations that are non-identically distributed, okay? Because um, why am I saying that I'm uh, independent but non-identically distributed? Well, because if you look over across J, you take cluster one and you take cluster two, they even have different observations. There could be N1, three observations in this cluster, it could be uh, whatever, 100 observations in the second cluster. So of course the distribution, and then we also want to allow that the X's have um, different distributions in different clusters, right? Go back to the schools or the cities, you're looking something like income, you want to allow for the distribution of income to be different across states or across cities, okay? Aside from the fact that you may actually have different observations in different states and cities. So 
they're not going to be identically distributed. We're not going to be making that assumption. Uh, but we're going to assume that the clusters that said are independent. So we're dealing with independent, but non-identically distributed random variables. And so we have this limit theorem over here. As I said, um, the law of large numbers, uh, we're going to discuss it, but the condition that I care about is this one that I'm going to discuss in the next slide because this is the condition that you're going to care about. Okay, the uniform integrability condition is a technical condition, let's call it a regularity condition that we assume. I'm not going to discuss it. Okay, you need it for all these law of large numbers and CLTs. You have to live with it. Um, the first condition actually is something you can interpret and it actually tells you what type of data you can handle with this and what type of data you cannot handle with this. Assumption clubs, which is this, and j over j goes to zero, um, says that each cluster uh, size nj is asymptotically negligible. Okay, so you cannot have clusters dominating. And I say automatically holds when nj is fixed and q goes to infinity, which is the original framework that if you just go back when all these cluster robust standards were Propose it was an asymptotics in which nj is fixed and q goes to infinity. And if you map this into the terminology that we use in panel, in panel, we had individuals that were uh, in that notation, you know, the index by i, and there were time periods that, um, sorry, and there were time periods one through t. t was fixed, okay, and n here was large in panel. But in a panel, an individual is the actual cluster, right? Because it's an individual with all the time history, okay? So if you were to write, you know, using the notation that we have today, uh, a panel model, you will be indexing individuals by J and the time by I, okay? And so you're saying time is fixed and individuals are large. And this is the original framework that I'm talking about here, which of course, a lot of this was motivated by panel data. So if n is fixed and q is large, then of course you're going to have that nj over n is just going to go to um, zero. Okay. Um, so the the important thing is that this condition over here implicitly is saying that you need q go to infinity. And we're going to be assuming this condition. This condition is going to be fundamental. So the first thing that I want you to retain, and I'm going to sort of say now, is that cluster robust standard errors and these tools that we're going to present today work when the number of clusters goes to infinity. Okay? And that's important to understand. You need a large number of clusters. If the number of clusters is not large, everything that we're going to say falls apart. Okay? But I'm going to talk about that towards in the last two slides. But um, just have that in mind. If there's one thing that you I want you to remember today is this, in a large number of clusters. Because the asymptotics, as you're going to see everywhere, are going to take n to infinity, right? And n is the total number of observation. But it is quite often, you know, for example, let's go back to the schooling example, okay, where you have um, schools that have thousands of students in them, okay? And then you have 12 schools, okay? So then you have, I don't know, 30,000 observations, 20,000 observations. So you say, oh, I have a lot of observations, right? But then you have Q clusters that are 12, okay? And the question is, do you think that asymptotics that take Q to infinity are going to approximate a problem with 12 observations uh, well or not? And that's the question you should ask yourself. Don't get clouded by the fact that you have a lot of observations. You have 20,000 observations. Just ask yourself, how many clusters do I have? because that's, at the end of the day, what's going to give uh, information. Um, this assumption allows for considerable heterogeneity in cluster sizes and it allows the cluster um, sizes to grow with the sample size so long as the growth is not proportional. So, as I said, in the original framework, NJ was fixed, okay? And this assumption over here allows NJ to grow. So we are allowing to the clusters to have big. We are also allowing for some to be big and some big small, okay? So in terms of like what you allow by this assumption is a lot more than what, you know, the original framework gave you. And the only thing as I wrote here that you're not allowing <coughs> is that the growth is proportional, okay? 
And you're not allowing, for example, for one cluster to dominate and be huge and the rest to be really small. So an example that we're going to use when we talk about rate of convergence is, is this. Nj is n to the power a. n is the total number of observations. For some a less than 1. And if that's the case, remember n is the sum of across clusters of all the nj's. And if you put just na, that's the sum of na, which doesn't depend on j. And so this is q times na. And then if you solve for this, you have that q is uh, n to the 1 minus a. So this case where nj is na and q is n 1 minus a, I'm going to use a lot in the next few slides. So just keep it in mind, take a look to see if she understands but it's certainly a case that satisfies the assumptions uh, that we, um, that I just wrote. One important thing is that assumption club is necessary for parameter estimation consistency while allowing for arbitrary within cluster dependence. As I said, otherwise a single cluster could dominate the sample average. And this is something that I want you to think about. Actually, I'm going to give you an incentive. I want to ask a question in the exam about this. Okay? Not short. It's really easy, but figure it out. Ah, that was the song that we were listening today. Good. So, any questions about this? As I said, I want to um, divide the class today into the notation, the discussion on the rates of convergence, and why that matters. Then we're going to just state the CLT and we're going to apply this to regression. So um, before we talk about the CLT, I want to talk and understand why talking about rates of convergence in this context matters. Whereas in the other context that we described in the class, we didn't even discuss this because it was always like square root n. Okay. So why do we need to talk about this? I wrote here under ID sampling, the rate of convergence of the sample mean is square root n. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, remember, square root n times x bar n, say, minus mu, goes in distribution to some normal. Okay, that's what it means. That's the rate at which we converge. Clustering may or may not affect this rate of convergence. I said often it does, but the funny thing is that the rate of convergence is unclear. And this is going to be a novelty relative to other things that we did. Hansen, 2007. By the way, this is not, this is, okay, this is uh, Bruce Hansen. And he was one of my advisors. And this is Chris Hansen at Booth. Okay, so Chris Hansen, this was his job market paper. Um, uh, essentially, the right of result says if dependence within the cluster is weak, okay, so there's data is not that much dependent, the rate of convergence is square root n. But if the dependence is strong, the rate of convergence is determined by the number of clusters, okay? And this is a result, as I said, it's like a 2007 result. Um, and and this was very interesting. And I, you know, I used to cover Chris Hansen's uh, paper uh, in detail before. But this, the problem with this is that this left a gap, okay? It was sort of like a donut hole situation. It tells you like the dependence was very weak, uh, then you you converge as if the data is ID. If the dependence is really, really strong, the only thing that matters is the number of clusters. And what if you had something in the middle? Um, it wasn't it wasn't covered. Okay. So that's why I wrote here there was a donut hole problem. What if the dependence is in between weak and strong? And so as I said, recently came this paper by Bruce Hansen and Lee, where it showed that the rate of convergence can be in between these two, and more importantly also could be even slower than square root n and square root q. So now the rate of convergence could be all over the place, could be anything. And so this is concerning because if you need to, for doing a T statistic, you need to multiply by the rate of convergence and the rate of convergence could be anything then, or you need to sort of like, quote unquote, guess what the rate of convergence is, that would be problematic. Um, this will not be the case in clustering. That's going to be uh, a beauty of it, which is the estimator of the cluster variance that we're going to propose is going to automatically detect the rate. Okay, And so all that we will need to do is to divide by the right standard errors, and we're good. 
And that's what I will try to describe in the next few slides, okay? The analysis is that the conversions rate can be calculated at, as the standard deviation of the sample mean. So when we say the sample mean converges at square root n, one way to find that out is just to look at the standard deviation. When you just look at the standard deviation, you see that when the data is iid, the standard deviation converges at rate square root n. And so um, we're going to try to do that now for the cluster setting under different examples. So hopefully it's clear this. The variance of x bar, remember that we wrote x bar before as 1 over n sum j1 to q xj prime this vector ones. And the important thing is that the data is independent across clusters. So the variance of x bar it's just 1 over n squared and the sum of the variances because clusters are independent. There are no covariances, okay? And so if you just take square root of that, the standard deviation is just 1 over n and the square root of this sum. We're going to look at this object. In every single example, I want to look at this object and see if this object grows at rate square root n, square root q, smaller, faster, and so on. We just need to look at that object, okay? Let's get started. Here's the object. I wrote it because I know you're going to forget, but it's there. Okay. And then these are the two easy examples. The first one says no dependence gives square root n rate, which is if the data is iid, we have square root n. We should know that. Okay. Suppose nj is na. So q is n to the 1 minus a. This is what we did before. Like we're going to assume throughout the examples this situation, okay? Because it's an easy to analyze. But the results are general. nj is just n to the power a, and q is n to the 1 minus a. And suppose that x is a scalar, okay? We're going to make it simple. Suppose that the variance is 1, okay? So that makes it really simple. And the covariance is 0. So observations are independent, iid. Then, what is the variance? We need to look at this guy over here. The variance of this x times the unit vector. Well, the variance of the x times the unit vector, which is here, is just the sum of the variance. Because in general, I'm going to write it here, the variance of xj prime is the sum from 1 to n, sum i prime 1 to nj, nj, of the covariance of xij, xi prime, j. Oh, I had it here, sorry. In general, that's what the variance is, because we need to sum all the variances and all the covariance. You, you can write that, of course, the sum of the variance plus twice the sum of the covariances. But in this case, there are no covariances because the data is iid. So this variance is just the sum of these variances, which is 1. So this is just nj. Okay? So now plug that in into this over here. Okay? It means that we have 1 over n, the sum from 1 to q of nj. That is what we have. The variance is nj. Just plug that in here. And so this 1 over n, and this nj is just n to the a. It doesn't depend on j. So it's q times an a to the power half. But remember, look at this. q here is n to the 1 minus a times n to the a. So what we have inside is n to the half is square root n divided by n is 1 over square root n. Conclusion, when the data is iid and there's no dependence, the rate of convergence of the sample mean, which is given by the rate of convergence of the standard deviation of the sample mean, is just 1 over square root n, or we say square root n rate. Hopefully that's clear. You may need to go back and redo some of these calculations, but believe me, they're like really elementary, okay? So the second example is a case where we get square root Q convergence, okay? And that happens when you have high dependence. So 
let's go over this again. We're always going to do NJ was an A, Q, and 1 minus A. X is going to be scalar in all these examples. Variance is going to be 1 in all these examples. Now, the difference is that here, um, the covariance of unit is 1. So, you know, the correlation is 1 because here variances are all 1. So now, the variance of xj prime the um, unit vector, as I said, is just the double sum of the covariances. And this is, if you write it as like the variance plus twice the covariance will be like nj plus twice, and how many covariances do you have? nj times nj minus one. Okay, so those are the uh, number of terms that you have. nj covariances, and then, you know, um, twice nj times nj minus one. Well, nj times nj minus one is essentially proportional to nj square. That's the term that dominates, not the variances. The covariances are the ones that dominate. So this guy is proportional to nj square. And since nj is n to the a, that means that the order of this is n to the 2a. So now we go back to the expression uh, that we have here on top. Let me delete this, what I had before. And so what do we have? We have one over N, the sum from J to Q of N to the two A. That's what we have. Okay. And so this, this is the wrong order. This, this should have been here. So sorry, it's a typo. So then how many terms do you have? Q. So you have Q times N to the 2A. And remember, Q is N to the 1 minus A times N to the 2A. So if you put everything together, you have that the entire expression is N to the negative 1 minus A over 2. But that's not other than square root Q. So square root Q is the rate when you have a lot of dependence or one over square root Q, as we were saying before. So these are the two cases that were derived or are related to the results that were in the paper by Chris Hansen that I mentioned before. If you have a lot of independence or very weak dependence, you're going to have something that looks like a square root N. If you have a lot of dependence and high dependence, you're going to have something that is square root Q. Now we're going to see two examples that go beyond that that are more complicated, but that are going to give us the in-between rate and also a rate that is actually slower than these two. So you can be in between these two and you can actually converge to a lower rate than these two, which to me was certainly a surprising result when I saw it the first time, because I, to me, was natural to think you can do as well as the independent case, you can do as bad as the dependent case, but you're always going to be sort of like in the middle. Uh, well, it turns out that the answer is no. But let's go first for the in-between example. So again, we're going to look at this object, and this example is going to give us an in-between rate with strong uh, dependence. So there's going to be a strong dependence, just not going to be one, just going to be strong. Okay? Again, I'm going to repeat things a lot, nj is n to the a, q is n to the 1 minus a, x is scalar, the variance is 1, and the covariance between two units, okay, is going to be given by some distance here. So here we're having something like, um, if you want, time series, because the, the labels of the i's matter here. So in some applications, this may make sense. In some others, it may not make sense. It doesn't matter. The point is that there are situations where the, if the dependence, you know, may become stronger or weaker, depending on whether you're far or close in some metric, this is a particular one, then you may have the situation over here. So the variance of x times the unit vector, I remember, remember, is the double sum of the covariances. But now this first part, the sum over i, or sorry, or this covariance is just 1 over i minus i prime, absolute value. And this guy over here is um, proportional to the log of nj because this is so-called um, harmonic series. 
okay? Whether you remember that or not, doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to, but just believe me, if you have a sum of things that are one over the absolute value, um, and that's proportional to the log of the number of terms that you're summing, the object that appears here at the top, let's call a harmonic series. And so if we rewrite this, we have the sum I1 to NJ of the log of NJ. And this is, since this doesn't depend on I, is NJ times the log of NJ. And since this is N to the A, this is N to the A times the log of N because in the log, the A, we can put it down, right? The constants don't matter here. We care about the rates. So we have that the variance of X prime, the um, unit vector is N A to the log of A. So now we want to put this in our expression of the standard deviation. So S the X bar N is one over N, sum from J1 to Q of NA log N, which as you can see, does not depend on J. So this is one over N times Q times NA times the log of N. But remember, the Q is n to the one minus a. So this is uh, one over n times n log n square root. And this is square root log n divided by n. So the convergence rate of the sample mean is square root log n divided by n. So I'm going to say here, fact one, square root n times the standard deviation of x bar n is square root of log n. This goes to infinity. So it means the standard deviation x bar n is slower than one over square root n. Because when you multiply by square root n, that explodes. So the standard deviation is certainly going to zero at a slower rate, okay? You multiply by square root n and it explodes. So, fact two, let's multiply by square root q. Square root q, standard deviation. Well, this is square root n, one minus a divided by n times square root log n, and this gives us square root log n divided by n to the power a, and this goes to zero. So standard deviation is, goes to zero faster than square root q. So this log n divided by n is somewhere in between. Goes lower than a square root n, goes faster than a square root q. And um, as we said in the title, it is therefore in between square root n and a square root q. So now we have three cases. There's no dependence, we converge at square root n, 
There's a lot of dependence, really strong. We convert this to a root queue. There's, I don't have a better word to say that just strong dependence. Uh, and it gives us a rate in between. And we want to see next, and that's going to be our last example, is a case in which the rate of convergence of this is actually lower than both square root n and square root q. Before I move to the next example, though, are there questions about this one? Okay, let's let's do the last example. Last example, same game, but we're gonna have a slower than square root n square root q rate of convergence when we have heterogeneity. So what is this gonna be? It's gonna be there are gonna be two types of clusters. Okay, there are gonna be the first type where q1 is just gonna be n divided by two. And these clusters are going to have one observation in them. Okay, this is an extreme, but it captures, uh, it simplifies the algebra. So I'm going to call here many small. There are many because it's n divided by two, and they're all small because they have one observation in them. And then the second type of clusters that are n to the uh, one minus a divided by two, and they have n a, which is what we've been using so far. And there are few that are large. So there are many small clusters and very few large clusters, okay? And that's a situation that we have, which believe me is something that, you know, um, could happen easily in applications. So Q here is Q1 plus um, Q2, which is of the order big O n, uh, as n over divided by two plus this. And within each cluster, the observations are identical and have unit variance. So we are in that case, the second case that we saw, except, you know, here there's only one observation, but in this case, there's a lot of dependence, okay? In the few clusters that are large, there's a lot of dependence, there's unit variance, okay? So what do we have? Let's work this out. We're gonna say sum j1 over q of this variance, because we already know the variance of xj times this indicator. That's just gonna be split in two. There are q1 clusters, where this variance is just gonna be one, these are the many small ones. And there are Q2 clusters where the variance is just going to be of the order n to the 2a, which is what we did over here. Remember, the variance in this example was n to the 2a. It was the case with unit variance and one, a unit covariance. Well, so here we have two types of clusters. The first one that it just have variance 1, the second one that has variance n to the 2a. Now, Q1, there are n over 2, okay? And then Q2, there are n 1 minus a divided by 2 times n to the 2a. And that's the object that we have here in the variance. So then the standard deviation of x bar n it's just 1 over n times n divided by 2 plus n to the 1 minus a divided by 2 times n to the 2a, the square root. And we can put the n inside. That's going to be n divided by 2 n square plus n 1 minus a times n to the 2a divided by 2n square, square root. And then we can cancel a few things here. And then this is 1 plus n to the a divided by 2n, the square root. And this is, we're going to write big O n to the negative 1 minus a divided by 2. We always gather the terms that dominate. And so now let's do the fact 1 and fact 2 that we did before. So let's say fact 1 square root n times standard deviation is uh, 
going to be um, a square root n. Or let, let me write, oops, n to the 1 half times n negative 1 half times a n. And this is just n to the a divided by 2 goes to infinity. In fact, 2 square root q standard deviation x bar n is the same as square root n standard deviation x bar n which goes to infinity because q is big O n as we saw here at the very top So, standard deviation of x bar n goes to zero at a slower rate than one over square root n and one over square root q. And so let me comment on this example. So the next slide comments on this. Um, I wrote, the final example illustrates the importance of considering heterogeneous cluster sizes, okay? All the previous examples, all the clusters were the same size. And I wrote, the reason why the convergence rate is lower than both square root n and square root q is because the number of clusters is determined by the large number of small clusters, okay? but the convergence rate is determined by the relatively small number of large clusters, okay? That looks like um, difficult to say, but that's just what's going on. That there's a small number of clusters, okay, that are large and have a lot of dependence in them. That determines the rate of convergence. But, you know, uh, the number of clusters is just determined by the large number of small clusters. So lessons from the examples and this, if you're just gonna get one thing from the example, even if you don't follow some of the mechanics, has to be this. The convergence rate of the sample mean can be equal to the square root n of the sample size, square root n, can be equal to the square root of the number of clusters, square root q, can be in between or could be slower. And this we did for the scalar case where x was scalar, well guess what? If x is a vector, each element may converge at different rates. Now you have a lot of covariates, and then it could be that some of these covariates are more dependent than others. And so when you just look at the convergence rate of the vector, each element in the vector converges at different rates. Okay. So the lesson I wrote here, under cluster dependence, the convergence rate is context dependent and variable dependent, and it is therefore important to allow for general rate of convergence without imposing an arbitrary rate ex ante. Okay, and that's gonna be what we need to do to get the CLT. But, you know, I said at the beginning, the first thing I want you to understand from today's class is that Q needs to go to infinity for these tools to work. And then after that, you may skip everything and just understand this slide, the content of this slide is really important, okay? And the next are gonna be the mechanics that we're gonna introduce in a few slides. But are there questions about this rates of convergence? All right, so now then, I wanna present the central limit theorem. And um, I wrote here, under ID sampling, the standard deviations of the sample mean is of order square root n, as we said. So square root n seems to be the natural scaling to obtain the central limit theorem. However, clustering, as we just saw, can change the rate of convergence. So it is essential to standardize the sample mean by the actual variance rather than an assumed rate, okay? So we've been working with the scalar case Think about now of the general case where X is a vector, the variance-covariance matrix, okay, of 
the square root n times x bar n is just going to be this over here. Notice one thing, which uh, this could be confusing, but hopefully you understand. I'm still going to multiply the sample mean by square root n. And then you can say like, well, why are you doing that? We just saw that it could be anything, okay? Well, it's the same if, if you just, you know, you just use square root n and then the variance of this square root n, x bar n is omega n, or you can just work with square root n and work with the variance of x bar n, which would be something let's call omega n tilde. It doesn't matter. You can just standardize by either. The reason why we're going to use this notation is because at the end of the day, this is going to map one by one to everything that we did before. If I now change and don't even scale by square root n, things and the expressions and whatever are going to look very different to everything that we did before, in particular for least squares. We're going to get to least squares in a couple of slides. So I'm going to scale by square root n and then just work with the variance of square root n times x bar as opposed to the variance of square root n, which is what we did in the examples. We could have done the examples following this approach. We would have obtained exactly the same results, but it would have been more convoluted. So clearing that out of the way, then omega n is just the expected value of n times x bar minus expected value of x bar, x bar minus expected value of x bar prime. And then if you just write it with the notation that we had before, is 1 over n, the sum over the clusters, times the expected value of xj minus expected value of xj, xj minus expected value of xj prime. So what is the right scaling? Then, as I said, it's just going to be this omega n inverse times square root n, and we're going to look at the limiting distribution of this object. And so if the rate is higher or whatever, it's just going to be automatically determined, okay, by this object. So of course, this result in a vacuum is not really useful because I'm multiplying by the true variance of x bar n, which in practice we don't know, okay? But CLTs are always stated like this, right? When you just think about the central limit theorems, they always divide by the true variance. And then something that we need to do later is to come up with a consistent estimator of that true variance, which is what we're gonna do later. That's the topic of today's class. But just for stating the CLT, the CLT here is just gonna be saying square root n x bar minus whatever divided by the variance of this guy, just going to be uh, going to a normal. And in the statement of the theorem, I'm going to be using this notation here that is lambda n, which is lambda minimum of omega, which is the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix omega. It's just going to appear in the statement. Okay, so in the next slide, I want to state the central limit theorem that works for cluster data. I'm just going to go over the conditions. I'm going to explain the conditions. I'm not going to prove this result. These results are proved in the paper, and um, the proofs are not really interesting for the purposes of this class, but I want you to understand the scope of the theorem and the conditions behind the theorem. So having said that, this is our theorem. It says, suppose that for some R that is two or larger, R here is going to denote the number of moments, we have a uniform integrability condition of uh, x to the power r. That's, as I said, the usual condition in a Lindbergh-Feller type of central limit theorem. And we have that um, this condition on the clusters. Okay, remember that before we had something like this. Now we have a condition that involves a sum. And here, notice that it's related to the number of moments that you assume. So here, this condition is going to say at the end of the day that there's some trade-off in terms of how nice the distribution of the x's are and what we need to assume on the sizes of the clusters. But for now, let's just leave it at that. We're going to discuss it in a minute. This condition over here is what we had before, but, you know, as opposed to what we had before, now we have a square at the top, you know, moral, which is always the case. Obtaining central limit theorem is harder than obtain, obtaining law of large numbers, so you need stronger assumptions. Okay, and then finally, the minimum eigenvalue is just bounded away from zero. So you have conditions three, four, five, and six, and what you obtain is that omega n um, square root of omega 
n times square root n times x bar minus mean converts to standard normal. And this is a CLT for cluster data. Let me comment on some of these conditions in the next slide. So assumption three states that, you know, x to the power r is uniformly integrable. When r2, this is similar, as I said, to the Lindbergh condition in the CLT and their independent heterogeneous sampling. Okay, this is something that you probably cover in 480-2. But as I said, it's just usual regularity condition, nothing to talk about. Assumption four involves a trade-off between the cluster sizes and the number of moments. It is less restrictive for large r and more restrictive for small r. So what you ask for your cluster sizes, as I said, there's this trade-off, like if you have random variables that are really nice and well-behaved and have a lot of moments, then you have, you require less on the heterogeneity in the clusters. But if you just have random variables that just have two moments and don't have other moments, so they have like, let's call them fat tails for lack of a better word, then you need, you know, stronger conditions on the number of clusters. And as R goes to infinity, this condition is essentially uh, this, which is implied by five. In other words, this condition over here doesn't mean anything if you have really nice excess, okay? Because it is gonna be implied by this. Assumption five allows for growing a heterogeneous cluster sizes, okay? And I wrote, it allows clusters to grow uniformly at the rate nj n to the a, okay? For any a, you know, now, you have these R's over here because they would appear in these conditions, but it allows for something like this, just that A is more restricted than before, that was just less than one. I wrote, no, this requires cluster sizes to be bounded if R is two. So with two moments, okay, you don't allow the clusters to grow. You don't allow for NJ to go to infinity. If you have more moments in the axis, okay, then you can allow for NJ going to infinity. And I said, it also allows for only a small number of clusters uh, to grow. Okay, example, nj equal to n bar bounded for q minus k clusters and nj equals to this for k clusters with k fixed. In this case, the assumption holds for any a less than one and r equal to two. So you allow for heterogeneity. My point is assumption five actually, of course, restricts the things that you can allow for and the things that you can allow for. But again, if we just relate this to the conditions that I said were originally stated in this literature, this allowed for a lot more cases than before. Assumption six essentially says that the variance of this object does not vanish for any vector C, so that the variance is positive. So saying that this meaning on eigenvalue is positive, essentially asking that the variance is positive. Since we're dealing with the vector, um, or saying that this matrix is invertible, if you want, and so on, the usual condition. So the only condition here I um, wanna claim that um, are very specific to the cluster context are these two. This standard, this really standard, okay? Not much to say. But the conditions that tell us how much clusters can grow and relative to others are the conditions that are new for this type of CLTs. And that's that, okay? The point now is that this CLT is not something that allows us to do inference because we don't know this omega n over here. So if you really want to use a t-task here to estimate something about the mean of x, you need an estimator of this. And that leads to the so-called cluster covariance estimator. So I wrote here, we now consider estimation of this omega n we're gonna assume that the variables have zero mean, okay, to simplify the expression, okay, which is something that is gonna hold later, as you're gonna see. So this omega n, which was this expression in the previous slide, if we just replace these two expectations here with zero and zero, it simplifies to this expression right here. So the natural estimator is just gonna be this guy over here. And this omega hat is gonna be called the cluster robust estimator of the sample mean. This estimator is robust to dependence within clusters, and it allows for arbitrary within cluster correlation patterns. And it also allows for the expectation uh, over here, 
which is uh, varies by cluster to actually vary across J. So it allows for heterogeneity. So implicitly later, this is also going to allow this wind means that it is going to allow for heteroscasticity. Um, and so essentially, um, this is what it is. As you can see, once you get to this point, if you understood everything we said, deriving this estimator is just sort of like straightforward. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, the only thing that it is fancy or the important thing is that um, the estimator is really agnostic about the dependence uh, of observations within clusters. And you can see that when you rewrite the expressions like this, where the estimator just essentially sums all the observations within a cluster, and then it computes sort of like a variance. So it's not saying anything about what's going on within a cluster. It's visible when you write it like this, where you see that what's going on within a cluster doesn't even matter over here. And when you compare it to the actual expression of the variance, you have an expectation over here, where guess what? For each cluster, you have one observation in a way, and that's how what you put in here. Okay. It's not that for each cluster you have multiple observations because those observations are uninformative the minute that you want to be agnostic about their dependence. All right, so final piece, and then we move to regression. I'm saying this is the estimator. Is it a good estimator? Yes, this estimator is consistent, okay? Since here we have a sequence of variances, the consistency says the sequence of estimators minus the sequence of true variances converges in probability to zero. And, and this is what really, really, really matters. If you just scale by sigma hat n as opposed to by sigma n, then this guy is asymptotically normal. And now we'll be able to do inference because we know x bar, we can compute sigma hat, and then we know it's root n, and now we can do a wall or a t-test. This shows that the CCE estimator, which is a cluster consistent estimator, is consistent and that replacing the covariance matrix in the CLT with the estimated covariance matrix does not affect the asymptotic distribution. Implication, cluster robusty statistics are asymptotically standard normal. They are rate adaptive, okay? The fancy word. We do not need to know the actual rate of convergence of X bar as the CC estimator captures this rate of convergence. And all this proofs as in the paper by Hansen and Lee. But rate adaptive, notice that we went over all these examples. I was asked before, okay, that, um, you know, that I said the rate of convergence is cluster is, um, sorry, the context and variable dependent. And in this theorem, what matters is that we have a vector here and we have this sigma hat. And guess what? All these examples that we learned that you could give, you could obtain a square root n, square root q, something in between, something is lower, and that could change for the different elements of the vector. Doesn't matter because rate adaptive means that this estimator over here is just going to capture the right rate of convergence for each of the components of this vector, and it's going to give us an asymptotic normality. So all these complications that we described earlier about you know how we can have different rates and different cases and so on doesn't really matter once it comes to the practicalities, because in reality, as long as you use this estimator of the covariance matrix, you can do inference without really caring about what's the actual rate of convergence behind. And that's um, really cool. So, further questions before we move to the regression setting and where we apply all this to the actual linear regression case. All right, we're gonna apply the results to linear regression. So this is what I said, you know, one way to, you know, teach a class like this would be to just start here. Just you come here, you present the results, it becomes a cookbook uh, lecture, and then you go home with your formula for the cluster robust standard error, you're happy, you don't know why things are uh, in a way or the other one. So hopefully this is better. Um, so go back to the regression where we wrote the regression indexed by the number of clusters. Remember, the observations within the cluster are inside this notation. And we're going to assume the expected value of xj, uj is zero. Okay, so um, the least squares estimator, the square root of n beta hat minus beta, can be written like this. Okay, one over n, sum over j of xj, xj, xj prime, xj inverse, 
1 over n sum of xj u. Exactly the same notation we use when we talk about panel data. Haven't changed a single component here, okay? Now we're gonna use um, the note by sigma n, this one over n sum of fx prime when you pass the expectation, okay? And then we're gonna use omega n to one over n sum of j to q to the expected value of x u u x, okay? So in other words, omega n is just gonna be the variance of this guy Sigma is just going to be the variance of the axis or the expected value of the object that is inside. Consistency, if the rate conditions in the theorem that we presented for the weak law of large numbers hold, this sigma n has full rank and it has minimum eigenvalue that is positive because we're taking an inverse and the uniform integrability condition that we wrote in that theorem holds for x, x prime and x prime u, then, you know, beta hat is consistent. That is the result follows exactly from the weak law of large numbers that I presented um, in a few slides ago, uh, provided that you check that the conditions in that weak law of large numbers hold for this setting, okay? So that's it. This is not really interesting, but of course, before we talk about asymptotic normality, we typically talk about consistency. So consistency follows because Q is going to infinity, in other words. Now, what we care about is a limit statement that gives a distribution so that we can do inference. Symptotic normality. I wrote to properly normalize square n beta hat n minus beta, we define this bn. And bn is gonna be sigma n inverse, omega n, sigma m inverse, where sigma n is this guy, omega n is this guy, usual sandwich thing. And you know we know the rate of convergence may not be square root n, so we're gonna follow what we did in the previous CLT. And then I wrote, we assume that the rate conditions in the theorem CLT hold for some r. Sigma n has full rank, so the minimum eigenvalue is like this. Omega n has full rank, so the minimum eigenvalue is like this. Uniform integrability conditions hold for x x prime and x primes u. And then if that's the case, it follows that b n inverse. Uh, so sorry, square root Vn, um, square root n, beta hat minus beta, converges to an asymptotic normal random variable. So least squares, okay, under the conditions that we introduce, converges to a standard normal, as long as you studentize by the true variance, okay? And this is a cool result. This is, you know, gives us the right of, rate of convergence, but it is useless to do theorem as it is because we do not know Bn. So what I wrote here is to complete the puzzle, what we need is an estimator of Bn that we're gonna call B hat with the property that if you just, instead of using Bn, you use B hat, you still have this asymptotic normality. That's what we really want. Once we have B hat such that this thing at the bottom holds, then we know how to do inference. Inference is just going to be immediate. So what we did then is to apply the weak law of large numbers and the central limit theorem to the regression context. We obtained the conditions that we want. Now what we need is what is this B hat? What is this B hat? Well, we know that B has this sandwich form. So hopefully B hat will have the sandwich form. And the sigmas are always easy. As I said, the bread in the sandwich is always easy. What uh, matters is the meat. And if we just put things together, we have the so-called cluster covariance estimator, which looks like this. B hat is one over n, the sum over the clusters, xj prime xj inverse. Then we have one over n, sum one to q, xj u hat j, u hat j prime xj, and the same breadth, where u hat j are just the residuals from least squares. And this is important in the special case where you have one observation for each cluster. This is exactly verbatim the HC estimator of the variance that we derived last week. Okay. What are the properties? Properties is the cluster covariance estimator is consistent for the matrix BN, okay, under the same assumptions in the theorem. And, you know, 
if you standardize your least squares estimator by this cluster covariance estimator, you get local, asym uh, sorry, you get asymptotic normality. Stata, as it is the case with the HC estimator, uses a uh, finite sample adjustment in the form of a constant. So if you compare, you know, what you code, if you're just computing your cluster covariance estimator uh, with what Stata reports, you're going to see that the difference is this factor, n minus 1 divided by n minus k minus 1, q divided by q minus 1. The estimator, as I wrote here, allows for arbitrary within cluster correlation patterns and heteroscasticity across clusters. And unlike hack, okay, it does not require the selection of a kernel or bandwidth parameters. There are no tuning parameters here, okay? Um, you, you can get away from these tuning parameters by knowing a lot about the dependent structure, meaning you're assuming that the clusters are independent, okay? And so by being able to group observations into clusters, you, in a way, simplify the problem, and then you can be really agnostic. This is, in a way, um, the famous cluster robust standard errors, if you just take square root. So how you do inference? Well, it's straightforward. If you just take a component, let's think about beta s, okay, the s elements of beta, and let's call b hat and s the s plus one diagonal element of this object. And we want to test whether beta s is equal to some number versus the alternative that beta s is different than that number level alpha. Then we can use the t statistic. It's just going to be square root n beta hat and s minus your constant divided by the standard error. Okay. It's particular if you just take this square root n at the bottom. This is the standard error that you're going to obtain, say, in stata. This guy, square root n one over n, blah, blah, blah. This converts to a normal. So you can reject just by using the usual normal critical values, okay? What matters is this, and I wrote important. This result holds regardless of the rate of conversions of the least squares estimator. You can have a lot of clusters and, you know, with few observations within the clusters. This is what I call here the traditional panel data syntax. You can have a lot of clusters and, you know, observations that are large within the clusters way. You can do this when there's strong dependence within the clusters. You can do this when there's weak dependence within the cluster. You can do this when clusters are heterogeneous in different sizes, different degrees of dependence. You can do this with covariance with different degrees of dependence. It's the same thing. The important thing is that the same test, sorry, the same test, okay? The same approach holds for all these cases. And so you don't need to take a stand of what's going on. You can just simply use it. And this is part of the reason um, why these are popular. Although I bet if we just grab uh, a user of cluster robust standard errors at uh, random, uh, it's uh, more likely that they do not know these features than they do know these features, okay? So I hope you pay attention to today's class because it's likely you're going to end up using these robust standard errors and it's just uh, good that you understand what they give you. Questions about that? Hopefully that's clear, but then I, I, I do want to touch on the issue of a uh, few clusters because that's a topic uh, that it's important in a lot of applications. All right, and that's going to be the end of uh, today's class. Um, there are a few things I want to say. The first one is what I wrote here, small q, ad hoc adjustments, okay? Believe me, there are going to be situations either that you're going to face or that you're going to find in somebody else's research where the number of clusters is really small. And um, by small, I mean, you know, everything that we did so far requires asymptotics in which Q goes to infinity. So what's large, I don't know, you know, um, is, is, is the usual discussion about how n, how large my n should be. But what I know is that if you have 10 clusters to say something, that's definitely small. And that happens in a lot of settings. You know, as I said, for example, your clustering at the province level and you have Canadian data, you have 10 provinces and that could be problematic. 
um, schooling applications where there are like 10 to 15 schools are really common as well. And so, uh, you know, you have a lot of students, but you have few schools. So what, what happens? Well, so as I said, often there are only few clusters, few regions, few schools, few states, etc. And so one thing that people do, or just what I call here, ad hoc, find example adjustments. And one of them was proposed by the, in this paper by Bella McCraffey, where they just proposed to change the estimator in a way that is um, analogous to what we did with the HC2 estimator when we talk about heteroscasticity consistent standard errors. So what they did is just replace the U hat with U tildes, and U tildes are essentially in matrix form, the same trick that we did before. You're just gonna use this projection matrices, and then you're just gonna replace the residuals, and then instead of using the B hat cluster or whatever, this is called BM for Bell and McCraffy, but you can call these the HC2 version of the uh, cluster robot standard errors, or you can call it CC2 version, okay? More importantly, this same paper, okay, uh, proposes uh, using, uh, instead of a normal critical value, a T critical value, where the degrees of freedom are data dependent, and then all the arguments, despite leading to something that, you know, oftentimes may work well in application, are ad hoc. And by ad hoc, I mean, you don't have a theorem that says under assumptions A, B, C, D, you have this result. Because, you know, in the middle of these derivations, for example, you're going to assume that there is homoscasticity. You're going to assume that this estimator is unbiased when it is not. You're going to assume that this estimator divided by something else is chi-square distributed when it is not. And so in that sense, they're ad hoc. However, this, you know, it's something that briefly you'll find, for example, stated in a book like Mostly Harmless Econometrics. And there's a recent paper that you saw in uh, earlier that I mentioned by Imbens and Collisar where they discuss uh, this type of approach and uh, reference to the variance Fisher problem that we briefly cover. But if you ask me, um, when you use cluster robust standard errors using this version, of the robust standard errors makes a lot of sense, okay? And it's something that I would actually encourage. The change is not drastic. You just need to do this thing. Uh, whether this is available as an option in Stata, I don't know. I should actually check that. Uh, it's certainly available in other languages. And so here, to give you a sense of how this works, I'm reporting simulations with a small number of clusters, 10, okay? And I'm presenting, you know, the results for the formula that I propose or that I introduce, the Stata formula and this BM. And here there are like infinity means a normal critical value. Q minus one is just a T distribution with Q minus one degrees of freedom. And the last row is this T distribution with kappa degrees of freedom, which are data dependent. That I'm not telling you here how you compute them. Those formulas um, are um, in the lecture notes and in the paper by Imens and Collisar. Okay, so if you're interested, you can see how that works. But now I'm just going to show you what are, you know, the performance of this. And then as you can see, you have different designs here with different levels on dependence and so on. You really want to get 95%, and you see that you quite often you don't get things like that 73%, 79%. Using a T uh, distribution in the clusters case uh, typically helps a lot more than before because as I said, Q tends to be small relative to the sample size. So using Q minus one is a lot smaller than using N minus one, which is what we're doing before. And so now you see how the performance actually improves from 79 to 85, 73 to 86, and so on in many of these designs, okay? The adjustment proposed, the constant adjustment in this data you know, helps, but you know, is not great. And then using this alternative, as I said, HC2 version of the standard errors already does a uh, 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 decent job. Okay, you can go from 73 to 84 or to 77 to 87. So it's doing quite a, a lot of work there, but it's not taking you to 95. And then when you do one of these ad hoc adjustments that I'm saying, uh, you get to numbers that are much closer to 95. So I've done work on this myself, and um, you can actually do find DGPs and situations in which this type of things are gonna work poorly, okay? But as a starting point, 
if you're in a context where there are like few clusters and you're for some reason you still want to uh, insist on using this cluster of all standard errors, uh, then at the very least you should try to uh, contemplate some of these um, ad hoc adjustments. As an alternative to these ad hoc adjustments, you can just look at what's um, in the literature that goes beyond this. And there's actually a literature on inference with few clusters, which really deals with the case where you do not do asymptotics in Q. Q is fixed, okay? And in those cases, it's typically the case that this thing's undercover, as I showed you in the previous slide. Um, the ad hoc adjustments tend to work, but sometimes, you know, they perform poorly. But as I said, there's the literature. And the literature right now essentially has more or less three approaches. One is the so-called wild bootstrap, which I'm not going to um, describe in this class. We're going to talk about the bootstrap uh, next class, actually, but I'm not going to talk in particular about the so-called wild bootstrap or sometimes called wild cluster bootstrap. It was proposed in a paper by Cameron Galbraith and Miller in 2008. The paper uh, did not show that this approach uh, work for fixed Q. Actually, the arguments in the paper are for large Q. And recently, in a joint paper with Andres Santos and Asim Sheikh, we actually uh, proved that the wild bootstrap works with uh, Q fix, but it requires assumptions that are kind of unpleasant. For example, it requires that the clusters are sufficiently homogeneous, that they have similar distributions of the X's and so on, which people dislike, but that's what you need for the wild bootstrap to work. And actually, if the distribution of the axis is heterogeneous across cluster, the wild bootstrap may perform poorly, even uh, in cases where Q is small. Then there's something called like an exact T approach, was uh, uh, proposed by Bragman and Mueller, 2010, which is just estimate betas or in cluster by cluster and then do a T test based on that. Very simple. Uh, it could work well, but it requires you to run regressions within each cluster. And then more recently, we proposed with Joe Romano and Asim Sheikh uh, so called an approximate randomization test. Uh, we're going to talk about randomization tests uh, in the last class, so you're going to have a sense of what this may be. But I'm not going to talk about approximate randomization tests, which is advanced, and I sometimes cover this in 481. But um, these are three methods that under some conditions, okay, this being... Uh, well, I don't want to say that. So under some conditions, we'll give you valid inference when Q is uh, small. But it's only when Q is small. If Q is large, this CCE um, actually works really well. Okay. Um, it's just that you. I, I said early when we started today, I want you to remember one thing. CCE works and it will give you valid inference as long as Q goes to infinity. Whenever Q is fixed, you're better off doing something else. And that's about it. And I got to the end.